Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Uh, so this talk is going to be about secure communication. And of course, the most prominent example being Alice connecting to Bob, the IACR web server, wanting to establish some HTTPS connection. And as we talk about secure communication, well, we expect there is an adversary spying on the IAC web server, or Alice, maybe. And well, in the crypto community, it's well understood that secure communication needs some form of a secure channel. So in particular, these two, Alice and Bob, will derive some shared secret, for example, through a key exchange. But the topic of this talk will be, what is this secure channel in practice precisely? So the first idea, of course, that comes to mind is let's encrypt. But as we are at crypto, let's encrypt authenticated. So what we want to have is both confidentiality, either in a weaker chosen plaintext attack, indistinguishability sense, or in a chosen cipher tax attacks. But we don't only want to have a confidentiality, but also integrity, either for the plaintext or the cipher text, where the cipher text integrity would be the stronger notion. And this forms roughly what we call authenticated encryption. Now, if we engage in a longer communication, then the order of messages becomes relevant, and that's where statefulness comes into the game. So you can lift these notions to a stateful setting, capturing both confidentiality as well as integrity under, for stateful uh, encryption schemes. And this is then what we call stateful authenticated encryption, and which was in particular uh, used to analyze the SSH protocol and confirm its security back in 2002. However, a few years later, in 2009, there was a uh, plaintext recovery attack uh, discovered against SSH, where the basic idea is that an adversary can use the fragmentation of the underlying network in order to uh, inject into a SSH connection ciphertext in a fragmented, in a blockwise manner. And by doing so in a very careful way, uh, observing MAC failures that occur to, due to modifications to the cipher text, this can be used to leak cipher, the plain text which will actually be sent. So this clearly constitutes a confidentiality break. But hey, I just said SSH was analyzed to be a stateful authenticated encryption scheme, so confidential and integrity protecting. So what's going wrong here? Well, the main point is the attack is essentially relying on, crucially relying on, the adversary being able to feed in ciphertext in a fragmented, in a blockwise manner, where these models capture only uh, decryption only in an atomic fashion for atomic ciphertext. So this is why, coming back to the models, uh, a few years later in 2012, Bolireva, De Gabriele, Patterson, and Stamm came up with the notion of symmetric encryption supporting fragmentation, which is essentially a generic, uh, a general security model which captures such ciphertext fragmentation. So on the encryption side, everything stays as before. You have a standard encryption algorithm according, uh, with an according left or right oracle for the security notions. But on the de decryption side, you now require that this decryption algorithm is able to uh, process ciphertext in a fragmented way and still should be able to reassemble the original messages as they were sent. And then in this model, uh, the authors define according notions for confidentiality as uh, the SSH attack was primarily on was a confidentiality attack. The question is, are we there yet? Does this already cover uh, all the practical attacks uh, one could have uh, on secure channels? The answer is no, because there are further attacks. In particular, there is the cookie cutter attack from last year on the TLS protocol. The basic idea here is that in TLS, an attacker is able to truncate a TLS connection by closing the under, underlying TCP connection. And by doing though in a, uh, yeah, carefully, uh, he's actually able to chop off certain parts of transmitted messages. And if you have an HTTP connection running, what this attack was focused on is the cookie that is sent. And by cutting off parts of that cookie, you get uh, security attacks on the actual communication. So to be a bit more, be a bit more precise here, the cookie cutter example is the following. When Alice and Bob uh, communicate, Bob being the server, and Alice authenticated, then at some point, Bob will probably send over to Alice an authentication token to remember her and say, please send this back to me when you're talking to me again, so that I know that's still Alice talking to me. But be aware, this is a secure, security critical uh, cookie. So this is what this secure flag indicates. So in particular, please only send this back to me over a TLS-protected TLS uh, communication channel. 
The Kui cutter attack in the simplest uh, representation just means now that an adversary is actually able to chop off this part of the cookie string and then Alice interprets this cookie as a standard cookie and happily sends it back to the, to the uh, web server even over a non-protected communication and there the adversary can just grab uh, the thing from the wire. So wait again, this basically means that the adversary is able to delete parts from within a cipher text. So how can this be possible? To explain this, let's have a closer look at how the uh, quick cutter attack <coughs> actually works. So on the server side, at some point the server will encrypt its response, including this cookie, and what we expect and would model in crypto is that there is a cipher text coming out of that. So if you go one step closer to the implementation layer, there will be some SSL library doing that job. For example, OpenSSL, but that's not uh, specific to OpenSSL. And you will use some uh, function of OpenSSL to encrypt or write data into the, street, into the channel. Turns out that for properties of TLS that I'll come to in a second, this encryption might actually turn, uh, might be turned into two separate TLS records. And if they are now sent over uh, the, the wire, the adversary is able to uh, truncate the connection at the right point, chopping off the second uh, record, product, record um, packet, and Alice will be left with a fragmented cookie and mis may misinterpret that uh, in a way that it's not a secure to token anymore. Main important, more, main important point here is that this fragmentation in TLS is actually implementation specific. So any library might do that fragmentation up to certain boundaries in its own way. And this means that an adversary is actually able to enforce this split potentially at any point of the message you send. So the receiver will not see messages anymore, but fragments of messages uh, with no clear message boundaries preserved. Well, this might sound a bit strange, it's actually a behavior that's okay because the data sent is a stream and that's what's specified even in the TLS RFC. So if you go there and look at to uh, fragmentation specification, it says that message boundaries are not preserved within TLS uh, records or TLS ciphertext, which means that either two messages might go into one uh, record um, packet or a single message might be split up to, into uh, several uh, ciphertexts. So in the end, the point is that TLS actually never promised you to treat message in an atomic way. And TLS is not alone in that sense. Uh, there are more and other important channel protocols which do de treat data as a stream without boundaries. So there's SSH in tunnel mode, which does that, and also the uh, uh, quick protocol proposed by Google two years ago uh, does treat data in a stream-based manner. So what we have here now is then a gap between what the channel models we have capture, atomic message sending and receive, or atomic message receival basically, and the behavior that this channel, in particular here at TLS, actually exposes to the application. And this is why we uh, came up with a notion of stream-based channels and a model for that. Where the idea is, well, first of all, what you receive on the sender side, uh, what the channel receives and is supposed to process is a stream, and it might get fragments of that stream in an arbitrary way. And then we have a sending, or if you wish, an encryption algorithm, which takes uh, these fragments and converts them into some ciphertext fragments, and again, forming a stream. An important point here is that this, in particular, allows for buffering. So not every call on the, of the sending algorithm might lead into a ciphertext being or ciphertext fragment being output, but there might be the sending algorithm buffer until you provide enough output. And then to allow the application to say, okay, now I'm done with what I want to send, uh, there's a specific flush flag that we allow for in the sending algorithm telling, now I'm done, please make sure everything is out on the wire. So then this uh, constructed ciphertext stream will be transported over to the receiver side <coughs> via some lower layer uh, transmission protocol, for example, TCP. But as there might happen fragmentation, uh, Bob on the receiver side will potentially see a f differently fragmented representation of the very same stream as long as there's no modification. And we now ask that the receiving decryption algorithm uh, is able to process this stream again in, a fragment in this fragmented way and reconstruct the uh, message stream that was sent. However, notice that 
uh, we do not require that message boundaries are preserved. So as while you will see the same stream, if nothing goes wrong, uh, the fragments that you will see on the receiver side uh, will potentially probably not coincide with the boundaries you had on the sender's calls. So for correctness, we require that whatever you receive is a prefix of what you send, so basically there is nothing else coming out. And to capture what the, uh, the flushing flag should uh, do is, well, everything that you put into the sender side up to the last flushing call should also appear on the receiver side. So for security, confidentiality, we define uh, indistinguishability under chosen plain text fragment attacks. So we allow fragments on the sender side, basically in a very straightforward way using a left or right oracle, which is additionally, where well, additionally the adversary is able to control the flushing flag. Modelicat is the chosen ciphertext case. So the general idea to step back for a moment, in chosen ciphertext attack, you want to allow as much decryption as possible while uh, preventing trivial attacks. So in the standard, in the uh, standard um, stateful authenticated encryption setting, the idea was to have this decryption or receiving oracle, so the oracle simulating this receiving algorithm, that oracle can be in sync or out of sync. Where in sync means it's still receiving the correct, the original ciphertext, or in our case, the original ciphertext stream. And well, this is the challenge ciphertext stream, so there should be no output given to the adversary. However, as soon as this stream goes out of sync, so as soon as there is a deviation from the original output ciphertext stream, the output of the receival algorithm should be given to the adversary. The interesting and complicated question now is, at which point exactly should this receiving oracle be considered out of sync? So to consider again the work uh, from 2012 on ciphertext fragmentation, uh, the definition there is, consider you have uh, four fragments received um, and processed, and the adversary uh, flip, starts flipping bit in the third fragment. <clears throat> Then uh, this paper defines synchronization to be lost at uh, the beginning of this third fragment, the affected fragment. Basically meaning that the first two, out, outputs of the first two fragments will be uh, suppressed, that's still challenge ciphertext, whereas the second two outputs will be given to the adversary. If you now think back to the, at the cookie cutter attack and this way that a message is potentially split up into a ciphertext containing independent parts, what you might end up with is that you get two independent parts here and you can modify the second part while still keeping the first one basically untouched. So this means in this model, uh, the first part, the first uh, TLS record will be given out to the adversary, but that's then challenge message bits. So in that sense, TLS in this fragmenting way would be considered insecure as it's leaking challenge message bits. So the key insight for having a fragmented encryption algorithm as well is that there is no inherent structure on a stream. In particular, the boundaries, the ciphertext fragment boundaries, do not have an implicit, intricate meaning. Um, so that's why we define the receiving the decryption oracle as follows. First of all, for the in-sync or already out-of-sync case, everything is as before. As long as you're still in sync, the output is suppressed, that's definitely a challenge message part. <coughs> challenge ciphertext part, sorry. If you already have gone out of sync, the full output will be given to the adversary. The interesting part is now the fragment which contains the deviation. So here we first we process both the only the genuine part and the full fragment using the receiving algorithm, which will lead to two uh, message outputs. And then we know from correctness that on the genuine ciphertext part, by correctness, there will be only genuine cipher message bits coming out. So now we can compare the longest common prefix or check for the longest common prefix of this challenge message part and the full output on the actual fragment that the adversary wanted to uh, have received. And we know this part must be challenge message bits, so we suppress this, this uh, part of the output and give the remaining output back to the adversary um, to, in order to uh, leak the, the modified part of the ciphertext fragment. And for the TLS example, well, the unmodified part would be still a common, um, long, a common prefix, whereas the scrambled part would go to the adversary. Coming to the relations of the notions we define in our work, well, first of all, the classic implication, implica sorry, <laughs> implication is still old. So for confidentiality, the chosen ciphertext uh, 
security notion implies the chosen plain text uh, security notion. And for integrity, which I don't have the time to define and show you here, um, as well, ciphertext stream integrity implies integrity of plain text stream. By the way, this is the first uh, non-atomic treatment of integrity as the 2012 ciphertext fragmentation work focused on confidentiality. And then there's the classic composition result for um, channels. So that's CPA confidentiality and ciphertext integrity gives you the stronger CCA confidentiality. Here the idea is that basically whenever in the CCA, in the decryption oracle, the, out, the, L, the adversary is able to make anything else than an error come out, it breaks integrity. So basically you can simulate this oracle by outputting the error. Then in 2003, uh, so, sorry, in 2013, uh, the multi-error setting was uh, considered. So what happens if you have more than one error that potentially is output? And there you can resurrect the composition result by assuming that at most one of these errors is actually visible to the adversary and then you can still simulate by outputting this one. So we would like to have the composition result also in our setting, meaning that we want to have chosen plain text fragment attack, security, confidentiality, together with ciphertext stream integrity, uh, give us the stronger chosen ciphertext fragment confidentiality. However, in this stream-based setting, we are inherently in a multi-error setting because the receiving output might be buffering and we don't know whether it, on a deviating uh, part of the ciphertext stream, it will already give you an error or it will still give you nothing because it's buffering. And both of these will occur with non-negligible probability depending on your input. So what we do to uh, get the composition result in our work is we require an additional property which we call predictability of errors. It basically says if you're given the send ciphertext stream and the receive ciphertext stream as well as the next fragment to be processed, you can predict the errors coming out. Together with this, we can resurrect the composition. While this notion might sound intuitively a bit strong, it's actually achievable in many natural constructions and I will now uh, present you with the generic construction we give you, we give in our work. Uh, this construction is based on uh, AAD, authenticated encryption with associated data, so stateless uh, version and achieves both the strong confidentiality and integrity notions. And the basic idea of this construction is, well, if you receive a message stream, the sending algorithm will chop up the messages into uh, blocks of a certain length, and as well keep a sequence number. So the idea is, up to a certain length, you put these uh, the message blocks or parts of a message stream into a single AAD call using the sequence number as uh, authenticated data, and you put an unencrypted length field in front of the construction. If you have to flush, maybe this uh, encryption will get less bits in this call. And then on the receiving side, because of the length field, you can you know how long you have to wait until you get the full AAD block for a certain part, and the AAD security will basically tell you, well, as long as everything is fine, you will get this message part coming out. Otherwise, the AAD scheme will tell you, hey, there was an error, and this is the error of the stream-based channel as well. In particular, this scheme uh, satisfies this error predictability notion, and we indeed use it to prove uh, security, um, which basically uh, results from the length field being unencrypted, so in this way you can predict at which point the AAD scheme will come to an error notion. Interestingly, uh, moreover, this construction, while it's kind of the natural construction you can think of, of getting stateful, a stateful um, channel running, it's actually pretty close to what uh, TLS does in the record layer design if you're using an AAD scheme <coughs> as your encryption algorithm. So first of all, you as well have an unsend sequence number, which is authenticated as the associated data field. You have a length field, with this, which is sent but not authenticated. At least that's the case in the latest uh, TLS 1.3 uh, version drafts. However, it's not claiming this is TLS. Uh, there are definitely differences. And the most important ones, there are more fields, for example, in TLS, particularly uh, version number, for example, and the content field, which allows kind of a multiplexing of data. Um, these are both, for the record, send and authenticated. So to conclude, data is a stream, and we believe that we should uh, treat it as such and model it as such in our uh, works for um, formal analysis. So we formalize what we, uh, the notion of stream-based channels and come up with adequate notions uh, that cover security in the setting. Moreover, we're able to reconstruct the composition theorem also in this world. 
and then showed you a sketch of the AAD-based construction we have, which is relatively close to the TLS record layer design, proving kind of a, a validation of that for the stream-based setting. And well, in the end, this work constitutes kind of a formal light on how, where the where recent attacks, in particular the cookie cutter, cookie cutter attacks, stem from, which is basically the application as well as the uh, models capturing received messages as atomic, <coughs> whereas the channel, in that case TLS, actually provides a streaming interface and never promised to give you back atomic messages on the receiver side. So this work can be considered as a start. There's still ongoing work. In particular, we explore the exact relation uh, between the atomic notions for channels and the stream-based one we come up now. There are additional properties that might be worthwhile to consider. First of all, length hiding is an uh, established notion for <coughs> authenticated encryption in the atomic setting. The question is, however, what length hiding can or should mean on a stream. And as I said, uh, several protocols allow for multiplexing. TLS is an example, Quick is a more prominent example, where several data, like message data streams, go into the same uh, secure channel. And in the end, well, if your application is happy to send a stream, that's fine. But what if your application actually wants to transport over atomic messages? How can that safely, provably secure, be done on a stream? This concludes my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>